Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Taifa Alexander, and I'm the Assistant Dean of Students for Diversity and Leadership Development at Wofford College. Thank you all for joining today's session, Anti-Racism 101, Creating an Anti-Racist Classroom. On Tuesday, we examined the larger historical systemic barriers to um, inclusion in anti-racist classrooms within higher education to gain a better understanding of how centuries of federal, state, and local practices and policies have perpetuated um, to exclude communities of color and Black communities in particular, which has led to inequities in the discrimination of knowledge and frustrated students of color ability to thrive in their academic pursuits. In discussing systems of oppression, the origins of all disciplines within higher education um, have served as tools to uphold the falsehood of racial hierarchy. And in Tuesday's session, we learned how to disrupt these systems to ensure we can identify barriers to an anti-racist classroom. They, today, we're going to be given some tangible um, tools on how to do so and how to disrupt those systems. So we're going to engage in a discussion on how to begin the process of incorporating deliberate actions of decolonization in the classroom to create anti-racist classrooms. And so in framing our discussion on how to create an anti-racist classroom, our panelists will begin by providing us with definitions of an anti-racist classroom and advisement. Then they will provide examples of both racist and anti-racist classrooms to allow us to distinguish between the two. And finally, we will discuss hypothetical scenarios from Black at Wofford where anti-racist behavior can be invoked to disrupt racist systems of oppression within higher ed. A prerequisite for attending this session and for engaging in anti-racism work is a willingness and commitment to use your dominant identity to center and uplift marginalized voices as equitable partners in disrupting racist oppressive systems of inequity wherever present. So I thank each of you in attendance for committing to that fight. As attendees, you all had the opportunity to submit questions for the Q&A portion in our registration form. However, you can still use the chat feature to privately send questions to our lovely hostess with the mostest, Nadia Glover, and we'll make every effort to answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion um, at the end of the session. We might not be able to answer all your questions, but with the use of the breakout rooms, we hope to be able to continue the discussions further. So after the hour, there will be an option for session attendees to engage in the breakout discussions, and there will be a member of the anti-racism action team in each room to help guide those discussions. Please note that while the panelist discussion and Q&A portion of this session will be recorded and made available widely later, the breakout sessions will not be recorded. Additionally, any attendee who is engaging in disrespectful, harassing, or racist behavior will be removed from this and future sessions going forward. So now I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. Dr. Chad Topaz received his bachelor's in applied mathematics from Harvard University and his master's and PhD in applied mathematics from Northwestern University. Dr. Topaz is an applied mathematician and data scientist at Williams College. His research on complex and nonlinear systems has been supported continuously by the National Science Foundation since 2006. This work examines problems in the natural sciences through several lenses, including data science, modeling, analysis, topology, geometric dynamical systems, numerical simulation, and experiment, all with an eye towards understanding and predicting complex behavior. Dr. Topaz's other stream of research applies quantitative tools to expose and remedy social injustice and is based out of the Institute for the Quantitative Study of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity, which he founded. Welcome, Dr. Topaz. Dr. Kenya L. Goodson earned a PhD in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Alabama, being the first African-American woman to receive a PhD in her department. She had nine years of experience in waste water management, stormwater quality, and environmental regulation before transitioning into academia. She currently serves as faculty at the University of Montevallo, where she teaches environmental science to non-major students. Additionally, she teaches science and mentors college-bound 
first generation college students in the Stillman College Upward Bound program. When not teaching, she serves on several environmental boards advocating for environmental education, environmental justice, and outreach. She also volunteers her time in environmental lobbying, voter outreach, and voter education around environmental issues such as climate change. She coins herself as an educator and an advocate who empowers others to find their own voices through knowledge. Welcome, Dr. Goodson. Dr. Steve Halby is originally from Bogota, Colombia and immigrated to the United States at a young age. He received a bachelor's in natural science with an emphasis in biology from California State University, Los Angeles, and a master's in biochemistry from the same university. He obtained his PhD from Cornell University and is currently doing a postdoc in the lab of Dr. Gonin at the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Halby. We also had another panelist who unfortunately was unable to join us today. And she is a personal friend and femtor of mine. And so if you all can send her um, light, love, positivity, good vibes, good juju, anything, we would appreciate it. And Professor Wittenberg's attendance in this panel will definitely be missed. Um, but thank you to everyone who was able to join us today. And I'm gonna kick us off with our first question. So throughout these um, virtual anti-racism 101 series, we have intentionally examined the structural implications of systemic oppression and how policies and practices have operated for hundreds of years to disenfranchise communities of color, which in turn contribute to an individual's misunderstanding of how policing, protesting, proliferation of Confederate monuments, inequitable seeding of sacred lands, and an overall miseducation of how systems of oppression are intentionally and deliberately interconnected to largely disempower people of color and difference. We also learned over the course of these eight weeks that anti-racism is absolutely in in integral in dismantling these systems. But what does it mean to have an anti-racist college classroom or advising experience? How do we define an anti-racist college classroom or advising experience? What does it look like? Um, how does it feel? And so this is a question to all our panelists, but we'll let Dr. Topaz answer first. Thanks, Taifa. Um, I do just want to quickly say thank you for having me here. I am really inspired by the work that's going on at Wofford. I'm, I'm gobsmacked in a great way. Um, so thank you all for doing that work and for being here. Um, let me preface what I'm going to say just by quickly saying that I think when white people like myself try to take anti-racist actions, it's really important to um, do so in a humble way. And sometimes I might get it wrong. Um, and so I just want to say I'm always open to um, other, to critique and other opinions um, about uh, how to frame things and about what should be done. Um, so with that said, um, I'll quickly tell you how I think about an anti-racist classroom, but I think, you know, going on Taifa's question, I need to tell you what I'm using as my operationalizable definition of, of racism and, and anti-racism. Um, and here I, you know, really um, draw from Ibram Kendi's work. And so he said, and by the way, if you haven't read How to Be an Anti-Racist, I highly recommend it. Um, but he says that basically a racist policy, it, it's something like it's that one that produces or sustains inequity between racial groups. And so an anti-racist policy is one that produces or sustains equity. And so what anti-racism means is supporting an anti-racist policy through actions or by expressing an anti-racist idea. And so like in brief, Right, to put it all together, anti-racist teaching is teaching that produces or sustains racial equity. Um, in my case, because I'm in STEM, I'm going to have to produce it. We don't have a lot of equity to sustain. Um, and I will be way more specific about the five things I'm going to very quickly mention in my next response. I think there will be a chance. But when I think about anti-racism in the classroom, I think about at least these five things. I think about enrollment. So how can I foster a course roster that moves my discipline towards equity. I think about pedagogy. So what teaching techniques can I adopt to help produce equitable educational outcomes? I think about class environment. So what steps can I take 
to create an inclusive learning experience. I think about curriculum, which is how can I remove or mitigate white supremacy in the course material, in the discipline itself. And I think about assessment, um, which is uh, how can I evaluate students in a way that reduces rather than exacerbates racial inequity. Thank you. Um, Dr. Goodson, would you like to weigh in? Yes, I would definitely like to weigh in on that. Um, I would like to first say thank you to the Wolford Anti-Racism team for allowing me to be here on today. And I'm definitely looking forward to learning something as well as being able to contribute today. So when I think about anti-racism, and, and I did some research on this when I was preparing for this meeting today, and my understanding of anti-racism is taking direct action to eliminate uh, racial norms in the classroom. So instead of being passive, you're being um, really active in what you're doing. And so when I think about anti-racism in my class, me being an African-American professor um, at a predominantly white institution, I have different class dynamics, correct? So when I come into the classroom as an African-American, uh, I need my students to understand that uh, mutual respect between me and them, uh, I'm there to help them learn, and that I'm also a professional. So um, there's this narrative that um, African Americans, you know, don't go into STEM. There's this stereotype that, you know, we don't know as much about science or math as um, non-Black students, and that's just not true. So when I come into the classroom, I set a tone where they understand that I have the credentials. Um, I am qualified to teach this class. Now, some of you guys, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but um, I do ask my students to refer to me as Professor Goodson or Dr. Goodson, and that's just a matter of respect for my professional salutations and my background. And especially since a lot of students, black and white, and you know other ethnicities, never seen an African American professor in science in their classroom. So I want to make absolutely sure that they understand that I deserve to be well. I deserve to be here. I can offer something to you and you can learn something from me. So that's just one example. And I'll just use one more. I had like several of them. But um, the one that I wanted to use that I thought was important is um, what Dr. Topaz mentioned is, you know, bringing issues around race into the classroom. And with me being a science teacher, that has to be very deliberate. And when I talk about environmental science, I talk about the social issues around environmental science. And what I try to do with my students is to make sure that they understand what is going on in their environment, in their state, that is surrounding racial and social um, injustices around in the, in the environment. So I'll stop there, because I'll keep going. Um, and I know you have other panelists, so I'll be quiet. Um, Dr. Halby, um, do you have any insight into this question? Um, yes, thank you, Taifa, <clears throat> and thank you for the invitation. Um, so I agree with what the other two panelists have said, but I want to take it maybe a little bit earlier, uh, maybe outside of the classroom in order to create an anti-racist classroom. So it's been over, uh, it's been over like 60 years since Brown versus um, Board of Education, right? And yet, Many of our schools are still segregated. Uh, there was a fairly recent Times article that stated that more than half of the nation's school children are in racially concentrated districts. Not only that, um, it was also discovered that uh, white school districts have a tendency to receive more federal money than schools that are not uh, that are segregated. And we're not talking about just a million dollars or two million dollars. We're talking about twenty-three billion dollars more going to white school districts than other school districts. So um, in like 1963, James Baldwin gave a talk to teachers and somewhere along the line, he said something like, one of the purposes of education, and I'm taking it a little bit out of context, one of the purposes of education is to give students the ability to think for themselves, right? So if we are raising our children in these school districts, by the time they get to college, they've already been shown that people out there don't care about their education. So how do we create an anti-racist classroom is to take into consideration these experiences, right? Uh, there are many students that already go into 
uh, a college classroom, believing that they can't do it, that they don't belong there. So I think in order to create an anti-racist classroom, we need to show them that they are part of this system uh, by diversifying what they're reading, what we're teaching them, how we're teaching them, right? We're still teaching them, and I'm a Shakespeare fan, but why aren't we reading, you know, like, The Fire Next Time, right? Or why aren't we reading something like uh, The New James Crow, right? While we're still reading Macbeth and Hamlet. So we need to show these students that they are part of the system, that they do belong, that we failed them along the way, but there's a support system when they get there. Um, so I think it's very important to take into consideration everyone's experiences and let them know that they are part of this system by showing them that there are people out there that are doing what they want to do. And I think that's the way to do it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try to channel my best Nasha Wittenberg um, impression here, and I'm going to provide some additional um, insight as well. And so I think that most of us on this call understand that this work um, isn't a sprint and it's a marathon, right? This is a long journey. And while outrage and solidarity and, and passive sympathy are great, it's not enough, right? There, there is a requirement that all of us um, take an inward look at ourselves, the biases that we hold, the ideas, the values that were um, ingrained and conditioned into us to uphold and perpetuate white supremacy needs to be um, debunked and eradicated. And instead, we need to focus on areas in which we can insert areas um, of inclusive pedagogy, like all the other panelists have said, right? Take a look at your syllabus. What are you teaching? What can you teach, right? The, the main question we need to be asking ourselves isn't who else can I put in here? It's who's left out. If I look at my syllabus and I say, well, it's Hamlet and Macbeth again, instead of Baldwin or um, Morrison or a bunch of folks who have a lot of things to say about um, these topics, right? It's about mentorship, not just um, outside of the classroom, but also in labs, right? Who is being mentored in labs? Who isn't? Um, who's left out? We also have to look at um, the fact that um, BIPOC students don't have the same sort of mentoring opportunities as other students. Um, based on this, um, based on this system that we have um, created and perpetuated, right? And, and the data and the science is out there that proves these things, right? And to bring it back for the past eight weeks, we really have to ask ourselves things like Dr. Hallaby has mentioned, why is it that BIPOC folks are more likely to be low wage, are less likely to have access to AP classes and things that are going to make them college ready, right? Why are they more likely to have the essential jobs and be frontline workers, to be less likely to be insured or have access to quality health care? Why are they more likely to live in trauma care deserts or be in environmentally polluted neighborhoods, right? These are all things that we can do to create an anti-racist classroom. If we're asking ourselves these questions and being intentional about educating ourselves like you are today, then that's what is going to make a world of difference in your classroom. Especially when it comes to actively speaking up and speaking out and not letting certain comments linger in the air without answering them, but we'll get to that later on in the session. And so based on your responses, esteemed panelists, it seems as though creating an anti-racist classroom and advisement experience results from this acute awareness and continual acquiring of knowledge of an anti-racist framework, which includes a professor or advisor's ability to disrupt racism in the classroom and their advising appointments and labs and other places of learning and collaboration. So creating an anti-racist framework 
sounds both tangible but a bit elusive based on our responses, right? In the sense of how do we know we're creating that experience that's leading to an anti-racist classroom? And can you provide examples of what specifically to do to create that experience both in the classroom and in advisement? So the first um, panelist I'm going to ask this question to is Kenya. Yes, that's my question. Um, I think in order to really understand the climate of the classroom, um, that you, it goes back to the curriculum, what you're talking about in the class and how to infuse um, issues around race and culture and class um, into the subject matter. And as a science teacher, I have to do that intentionally. And um, because I'm a person of color, I'm always looking at it from, a, from that lens anyway. So I'm going to incorporate that into the classroom. So, um, put, so one of the things that we talk about, I'll give an example. Um, I did a talk about um, um, population control um, and climate change. And I asked the students a question. I said, do you think it's ethical to tell someone that makes less money in a developed country that they can't have but a certain amount of children. So that's like one of the questions that I ask them because there are um, thoughts around population control because you have more developed nations that have um, higher population rates and then the population rates are really um, lessening in more developed countries. But our footprint, our uh, carbon footprint uh, is higher. However, white supremacy says that instead of dealing with the more um, developed nations and the, our uses that cause car, um, climate change, you're looking at more developed nations, less developed nations, people who may not make, have as much money, and you're telling them that, hey, you need to control how many children you're having. So I do talk about that in one of my lectures and it is unbelievable the response, very positive feedback. Um, students are very open to give their thoughts and comments on it. And it's something that they've never really thought about. So, um, and it could be a controversial topic because you have so many people in so many backgrounds, you know, that may have different perspectives on that. So um, th that's just an example of something that I, incorporate in my class. And we talk about other issues uh, around race and class as well that relates to the topic. So. Thank you. And um, Dr. Hallaby, do you have a response? Uh, right. So the question is, can we provide examples of what professors and advisors can specifically do to create the classroom and advisement experience? Okay. So um, I think everybody has seen by now uh, a picture of somebody teaching back in the 1940s, 1950s, and there's a teacher up on the board and they're pointing at the chalkboard. And then they show a picture of, you know, current times and it's still the same method, right? They are still teaching the same way, uh, taking, not taking into consideration that times have changed, that now they can take advantage of uh, technology and social media to teach. Uh, so I would advise others, uh, or professors and advisors to uh, be more, I think, open to using other forms of teaching. Uh, I think, you know, students relate more to social media. I think students are more maybe technologically savvy than we are. So I may be incorporating more uh, resources on the web and such. But also taking, so, you know, uh, having said that, I also think it's very important, like I said earlier, to take people's uh, experiences into consideration. So how do you mm, create an anti-racist classroom again is to, mm, I think we all, there's like this, maybe a bar, maybe there is a, a starting point and it turns out that that starting point is not the same for everybody. Um, so, you know, we might be looking at, you know, uh, by this time you should be doing this, but that's not true for every student. So to give you examples, um, sometimes we look at students' grades and we think that from their grades, we, we think that that's their ability, that that's how good they are at whatever. But that's not necessarily true. 
uh, there are sometimes students that are not doing well in class, but now that's not because they don't have the mental aptitude to do the work, it's because they have other things going on in their life. How do you create an anti-racist classroom is when you see those students that aren't doing well, then you talk to them and find out why they're not doing well. Do you find out what's going on in their life? When I was in school, I had a family, I did research and I worked 60 hours a week. My grades were not low because I couldn't do the work. My grades, whether it be a C, it was impressive because I was never studying. And so I think in order to, to be a good professor, we need to really keep an eye on students, their grades, and take into account what their life is like, what's going on in their life. How do you create an anti-racist classroom is to take those things into consideration. Uh, like I said earlier, by the time people of color get to college, they're already at a disadvantage. They haven't been given the resources, they haven't been given the support that other, uh, non, uh, other students that are white have been given. So the way to create an anti-racist classroom is to take into account these things, to give them the support that they need, to create a, uh, like it's been said before, a syllabus that's more inclusive, right? And maybe more office hours or more attention to these students that may have been at a disadvantage. So I think that's how you do it. Thank you. Dr. Topaz? Sure. Um, wow, the prior panelists said so many great things. Um, and I'll sort of run you through my list as well, but um, you'll hear a couple of the ideas uh, that have been mentioned. I also just want to say um, that a bunch of what I'm going to say I've written up on a web page, which is like my running log I keep for myself of anti-racist teaching efforts. Um, and so I shared the link with Nadia, and Nadia, you're welcome to share it with the group if you want. Um, in case anybody wants more details than what I'm about to say out loud right now. But concretely, um, in my classroom, I th think about these five things I mentioned, enrollment, pedagogy, class environment, curriculum, and assessment. So in terms of enrollment, I'm thinking about writing a course description that has a welcoming and accessible language. I'm thinking about marketing my course so that it's clear that all students have the potential to succeed and then of course I have to follow through on that. Um, I telegraph explicitly that the class adopts an anti-racist approach, like I have begun saying that. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, while one maybe should not be excluding students from a course on the basis of race, I go out of my way to recruit students um, from populations that are up underrepresented in my field. And there's tons of ways for me to network with those folks on my campus. Um, in terms of pedagogy, uh, some things I keep in mind are reducing stereotype threats. Um, I won't list the whole list of ways, of things you can do to reduce stereotype threat, but they're referenced in that, in that page. Um, and there's a lot of them. Um, you can mitigate implicit bias. And I think it's really important to remember that we all have implicit bias and there's very disheartening evidence that actually sort of the more educated we are, the less we're able to recognize our own implicit bias because we think we can think our way out of it, which we can't. Um, so finding, using a bunch of strategies that are available to mitigate implicit bias is important. And then something that, um, that uh, was just mentioned has to do with uh, just different pedagogical modalities. And there's really convincing evidence that the use of active learning at least in STEM fields, because that's where I know the evidence, that not only does active learning increase student performance overall in STEM, but that it actually helps erase the racial gap in learning outcomes. And if you're interested in that topic, those papers are linked from the, from the post that I mentioned. Um, in terms of class environment, I telegraph my expectations to my students in my syllabus and in person constantly. And so I talk about things like, you know, um, we don't, um, like, you deserve to be addressed by the name and pronouns you wish to be addressed by. Um, we embrace diversity in this classroom. We don't put up with harassment and racism, these sorts of things. And then making clear what the policies are to follow through on enforcing those values. Um, you can um, use best policies for forming student groups. So if you're doing group work, 
there's, I, I know the literature better for gender, but I imagine that there are some parallels um, that basically you don't want to tokenize people with minoritized identities in student groups. So you can follow some of those um, best practices. And then there's even evidence suggesting that the physical environment of the classroom um, can play a role in exclusion or inclusion. So if you're working with a physical space, right, you can create a physical space if you have the resources that sort of represents the parts of humanity that you want to represent in order to be anti-racist in your classroom. Um, in terms of curriculum, um, you know, we, we spoke already, um, you know, Dr. Goodson was talking about um, like bringing anti-racism into your curriculum. Um, in my area of math, it's surprisingly easy to do this because we use mathematical tools to do so many things in the world um, and you can use it to study lots of different fields. So just as one quick example, um, I'll be teaching an introductory discrete math course this coming fall um, and I have students read a brief article that uses tools of mathematical logic, which they study, um, to sort of discuss privilege and discrimination. And the title of this piece is Privilege is the Inverse of Discrimination, where inverse has a specific mathematical meaning that they are studying. Um, let's see, other things, I'll just say, um, I include resources from as many non-white scholars as I can. So again, just with the example of logic, people always talk about the Greeks as the ones who developed logic. Not true. Yes, they made important contributions, but so did um, China and India and Africa. And we never talk about the contributions from those places. So I have my students read some sources um, pertaining to those contributions. And then, um, I even talk about the ways in which mathematical knowledge is subjective. In other words, people like to think, you know, math is this like completely black and white subject, right? Where something's either right or wrong. And this is not true. And even in the most formal theoretical of mathematics, what we decide, what we accept as truth is decided by people. And because of historical exclusion in those fields, those people are but overwhelmingly white. And so white supremacy underlies the entire field. And so there's some great historical examples of this that I call out for my students. And then just quickly, the last thing, I have never been myself a fan of letter grades. And I think one anti-racist approach to um, student assessment is to move towards um, non-hierarchical grading approaches. I'm not sure how many of you have heard about ungrading, but I will be doing ungrading with my students this year, um, which means I will um, not be assigning them letter grades. Um, I will be asking them to develop a detailed rubric to assess their own movement towards whatever goals they state as being appropriate for themselves. And I'll help them refine that every single week. But in the end, I will ask them, what grade should I assign you? And they will tell me, and I will assign them that grade. Thank you, Dr. Topaz. I did want to um, follow up again and um, provide some more examples. And so uh, one thing that we've seen um, oftentimes is professors would like to include um, BIPOC students into conversations that the professor thinks is important to that student, right? And so a lot of times what um, inadvertently ends up happening is we might have um, LGBT students who are talking about gender issues, or we might be um, asking Black students to speak on behalf of um, the impacts of slavery and systemic racism and things along those lines. One way that we can incorporate an anti-racist classroom is to create um, what I call a panel system, right? So you would go through the syllabus and go through all the class times and assign students um, to that particular, randomly assign students to that particular class. And that handful of students would know that um, they would be responsible for being called on that day to discuss that topic, right? Um, also, we don't want to make um, students representative of their race, right? We don't want to ask one student to speak on behalf of, of an entire group. And so this panel system, um, if done appropriately, has the way to guard against that. And it also um, 
operates to allow other students to be um, involved and engaged in these discussions that other students might be interested in as well. Another thing um, that we want to do is to create trust in the classroom. And a really good way to do that, or let me go back, creating trust in the classroom is important because if you do not create trust in the classroom and then you want to have intentional discussions about race, it's going to be difficult to maneuver because the students don't trust you, one, and then two, the students don't trust each other, right? So to, so to create a community of trust is really important. One way that that can happen is to create um, community standards in the classroom for the classroom that students are involved in, right? Because then they're connected to it and they are committed to ensuring that they um, operate in an anti-racist classroom, right? The other thing is that we really, 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 really have to address hot moments in the classroom as they occur in real time. And so there was a reading that was assigned and there are specific step-by-steps and language that you all can use in order to figure out how to do that and when to do that. It's important to share students' successes in the classroom as well, but only if the student um, wants you to, right? Um, that's important in building trust and creating trust. You also want to use a critical lens to identify and critique the power and privileges that, that operate, right? And you want to challenge any of those um, white normativity that comes up in the classroom as well. You also want to advocate for deliberate, consistent commitment from your institution, from your department that amplifies anti-racism policies, practices, and pedagogy, right? Those are all very important things to do. So now we're going to transition to the next portion of the session. And I want to thank all the panelists for their responses. I'm going to yield to my co-moderator, Dr. Camille Bethay, Chair of the Modern Languages Department and Professor of Spanish at Wofford, to help contextualize these definitions and examples through a series of hypotheticals and hear from each of the panelists on how we might be able to create an anti-racist classroom advising experience and, and environment. Thank you, Dean Taifa, and thank you to all the panelists for the discussion so far. So as we transition to the next portion of the panel, we do want to help you to contextualize the definitions and examples of an anti-racist advising or classroom experience through a series of scenarios. These scenarios were lifted in part from the activism taking place on Black at Wofford, where Black students, alums, employees, and members of the Wofford community in speaking truth to Wofford have shared their testimonials of racism and exclusion on campus. So in an effort to listen, amplify, and uplift this, these testimonials and to learn how to address these issues should they occur again in the future, um, I'm going to ask each of you to respond to the scenario and ask if you were the professor or the advisor in the scenario, how you might have approached the situation and provide any advice on what else you as a professor or advisor may do to address or redress the situation now. So I've had lots of colleagues comment to me that they have read Black at Wofford, that they were pretty shocked by what they read, um, and that now that they're aware, they want to do something to help, but they're not quite sure how to proceed. So I think that the comments that uh, our panelists share with us during this part will be particularly helpful. So um, this is an advising hypothetical, and Dr. Hallaby, we're going to start with you. If uh, there's time and the other panelists would like to weigh in with comments, then that's fine. So advising is one of the first experiences that students engage in upon entering the college or the university. And as research has shown, advising can be transformational in providing students with the opportunity to thrive within their desired academic pursuits. So in this scenario, a student who hopes to be pre-med as many Wofford students do, has reached out to you as their advisor after doing poorly on their first organic chemistry exam. They report that they went to the professor's office for help, where their professor asked, among other things, if the student has family in medicine. 
the student responded that they were the first in their family to go to college. After looking over the student's grades, the professor states that the student may be good at some things, but it appears that chemistry is not one of them. After which he encourages the student to pursue a different major and a different career path. So the student tells you that they are planning to switch their major from chemistry to biology, and they're not sure what to do about their pre-med dreams. If you were the student's advisor, uh, Dr. Hallaby, how would you respond to this scenario? Um, that's actually a good question, and maybe I can relate. But I have, a, I have a very good friend, and what she does when she encounters a problem, she goes through the options. If she's, uh, you know, there's something going on, she'll say, okay, what are my options? A, B, and C, and then, then you decide, right? If I were the, uh, the student's professor or advisor, that would be my, that would be my strategy. My strategy would be to uh, listen to what their concern, why they did poorly on this, and then come up with a list of scenarios, A, B, and C, right? and give them those options. For example, option A would be to, you know, uh, retake the test or retake the class because they'll have to, uh, if they're doing poorly in organic chemistry, uh, but they don't have to retake it right away. Maybe there are things in their life now that are preventing them from being able to focus on that now. Uh, option B would be to uh, get advisement, to get tutoring for the next exam and then take it from there. And you know there there's going to be an option C, but the decision is not mine to make; it's their decision to make. So I present them with mm, several options mm, that are uh, maybe uh, maybe an, uh, an option for now, an option for later, and an option for later later, and they decide what it is that they want to do. If they are first generation, that should definitely be taken into consideration. There are social pressures that I think if you are not first generation, you don't understand. If you are a Latinx, right, and you go to school and then you go back home and you study, your parents are asking you, why are you studying? Didn't you just come back from school? And then you need to help out. You need to contribute to the house. You need to, you know, help your brothers, help your sisters, go to work, do something like that. Uh, so that needs to be taken into consideration. Being first generation is, there is a lot of pressure on you to succeed. Uh, and so I think that's, that is not, immediately you don't if you're not first generation you can't you really can't understand that unless you've gone through it so my advice to the student would have been totally different my advice to the student would have been to uh here let's talk about it let's see what the options are we'll provide them just like my friend would do provide them with several options and let them pick it's not my decision it's theirs and you know they might do poorly in their first organic chemistry exam because they had something going on in their lives uh but you know maybe they'll do extremely well on their second one and to base it just on one exam it's it's poor advice and so my advice would be to give them options to take into consideration what's going on in their life uh and allow them to make their own decisions it's not my decision to make Thank you. That's great advice. And I like this idea of helping students think through what their options may be, right? That they don't have to make a, a decision based on this one exam uh, that's going to impact the rest of their time at the college. Um, so our next hypothetical involves academic freedom, the use of certain books or uh, texts in class, inclusive pedagogy, and making students spokespeople for their race. So Dr. Goodson, this next scenario is for you. And um, in this scenario, um, it relates to the classroom and some professors in certain disciplines choose to use literary works that contain races, derogatory language, like for example, the N-word. Some professors may argue that the use of the literary work, regardless of the derogatory language, is important in allowing students to understand a particular, a particular literary concept. Others may support the use of the book because they want to diversify students' exposure to prominent diverse figures like Toni Morrison, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, and others. So the use of the work is paramount to the language in the book. In this particular hypothetical, uh, Dr. Smith uh, chooses such a book with similar language. 
a heated, uncomfortable race debate ensues after a white student says the N-word in asking a question, but does not use the term N-word, and declares that if he could choose his race, he would not choose to be Black. After he says this, the room is so silent you can hear a pin drop. When Professor Smith asks the student to clarify their statement, trying to diffuse the situation, the student doubles down. In an effort to help explain to the student why their use of the word and their tangential statement are wrong, Professor Smith proceeds to call on one of only three Black students in the class to invite them into the discussion. So if you were the professor in this scenario, how would you respond? And what would you have done differently than what this professor did? Well, um, in my class, I don't believe in targeting certain students because of their, their ethnicity. I would never do that in a classroom. Um, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is when you're um, having a discussion, and I'll just kind of go back to the question about using the, the N word in the class, um, you, you will have subjects where you're have, you know, that were written you know, back in the 40s or 50s where you have that type of language in there. And I think that there are ways for you to use um, the information without actually, without actually literally using the term, the N-word. Um, I think the N-word is very, um, it's a violent word. Um, it's a word of oppression against our, our um, African-American community. And that's not language that should be used in a classroom. I do think that you can talk about the subject around um, you know, the issue of the, of the N-word and the, the racism behind it, and maybe talk about the content in the, in the book or the, whatever literary work that we're looking at without actually using that terminology. Now, I think you asked another question about um, the student saying, if I could choose my race, I would choose not to be Black. Well, I think in that particular case, that's what you call one of those hot moments. And I think in that case, there needs to be kind of a discussion of why that student made that comment. And there is a way to say it without, you know, targeting the student. You don't want to feel like you're attacking students in a classroom. So maybe ask the class in general, you know, how do you feel about race? You know, how do you feel about, you know, um, you know, being African American? How do you feel about being, you know, um, white in the classroom of you know, majority black or vice versa, depending on the structure of the class. Um, and then give students the option to have those discussions. So um, that would be some of the ways that I would address that. But I definitely would not use the N-word in class. Um, I definitely would not single out students um, based on their ethnicity. Um, I, think that's, I think that's racial violence. And I would not um, put my students in that type of scenario. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, sorry, may, may I chime in for a second? Uh, I, one of the, one of the uh, writers that you talk about in this example is James Baldwin, though. And he used the N-word all the time, but he used it to make a point. He used it to make a point that the word does not exist. There is no such thing as a, an end person, right? That it was an invention of white people. And so, the, I mean, if you're, going to, if you're going to introduce literature like this, it needs to have a purpose. And introducing James Baldwin would be an amazing idea because he's trying to make a point. He's trying to say that, no, this end person does not exist, right? That was just an invention. It was a, a way to suppress people. So if you're introducing literary works uh, that contain the N-word, it needs to be something like James Baldwin. It needs to be something that makes a point of trying to get rid of that word, not, not, to, not to perpetuate the word but actually to get it out of the vocabulary and, and try to figure out where it even came from. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, that was, that was a point, you know, talking about the subject around the N-word without actually using the word, right? You don't want to actually use the word in class. So yes, Bob, James Baldwin is a great example of what you said. Um, and just talk about the subject around it and why he used it. I, I, I agree with you, but using the word in class, yeah, no. In a classroom, no. <laughs> and then in terms of STEM, uh, this part where it says, I would choose not to be black. I can't remember if it was um, Jeffrey Mervis from American Association for the Advancements of Science. 
he writes regularly about race in academia, race in STEM, and he published something that said, like, if you are a white male, you have higher chances of getting a job in STEM than if you are a person of color with a degree in STEM. Uh, so I just wanted to comment on that because, you know, if really there are, if you're a white male, you, you're already at an advantage and you don't even have to do anything. You just have to show up. Um, so that needs to be considered also. Thank you to both the panelists. We're stretched for time, so we're gonna move on to the next question. Okay, so um, oftentimes we're made to believe that racism and exclusion do not exist. And so something else must be in play in a situation because it can't be those two things. So we're just now talking about STEM. And oftentimes we also don't acknowledge that systemic racism permeates the STEM disciplines. Um, so research has shown that as we think about who is supported in the academy, issues of inequity tend to rise to the surface and it becomes more clear who is excluded. So I wanna present another hypothetical as it relates to advising. And this time, Dr. Topaz, we're gonna to start with you uh, as you're a mathematician who's been trained and works in STEM. In this scenario, you're a major advisor in your math department and an advisee comes to you and tells you that they just spoke with the chair of your department who told them that they wondered if they were being overly optimistic about completing such a rig rigorous program. This isn't the first time that your advisee has had this issue in your department. And in fact, you overheard the chair tell one of your colleagues that your advisee doesn't belong in the program. So how would you respond to this situation? And how should we support BIPOC students that are interested in STEM programs? Yeah, thanks for the scenario. Um, in response to how I would respond, when the student came to me, I would first let that person just talk. I would just say, tell me what happened and how did you feel about it? Because I think it would be important for me to understand how they were processing the, um, the experience. Um, regardless, after that, and by the way, I should say, I don't think this was stated explicitly, but I'm assuming this is a BIPOC student who we're, who we're talking about. And so um, no matter what, I would be telling anyone told that they could not succeed in a mathematics program that they could. So I think I would have a long talk about all the specific reasons that I think the person could succeed and what mechanisms were in place to make sure that they could succeed. Um, I think I would try to suss out if the person had like a network on campus of people who studied the subject from whom maybe they could hear about the experiences of studying um, that subject. And I guess one other thing I wanted to say briefly is that my, I have a personal policy, which is that I do not create closets for racism. And so I can't know why my chair said this horrible thing, um, but I can have my suspicions and I can absolutely bring it to the mechanisms at the college that are in place to deal with racist behavior, right? And we have mechanisms where they will, because who knows, right? I'm not positioned to know like what my chair has said to all the other students who have also been in his office. Maybe other similar things have been said and reported. And so I myself think reporting is really important um, for that reason. So I would, I would report the, I would report the news. Um, yeah, maybe the other panelists would like to chime in. Well, we only have a few more minutes, so I think we're going to move on to our last question, which involves the same type of topic. But thank you, Dr. Topaz. I think that's very helpful. So our, our last question, uh, Dean Taifa is going to tackle it herself. Um, so we've probably all experienced these hot button moments where students or faculty or staff say things that are racially insensitive and completely inappropriate. Sometimes in these moments, we're stunned and, um, and, and, and kind of shocked into silence. Alternatively, others may kind of nervously laugh off the situation or change the uh, subject to avoid discomfort which oftentimes occurs when people feel as though they're not equipped to engage in conversations about race or difference. So in this scenario, Dean Taifa, 
Uh, this one's for you. As you're starting to prepare for class, you overhear a student refer to COVID-19 as Kung Flu, and you hear them making disparaging remarks about Asians or Asian Americans. The conversation evolves or defaults into the, devolves into the student saying that racism isn't that bad anymore because we've had a black president. And I've actually had a student say this in my class. Um, that racial profiling doesn't occur, black people are pulled over because they're doing suspicious things, etc. So how do you respond when you have these um, hot button moments where someone says something wildly inappropriate? Um, and there's a, you know, any way, but especially in a mixed setting where there may be different uh, types of students in the class. And then what advice do you have for us when we find ourselves in these uncomfortable situations? Absolutely. So like I mentioned or alluded to before, you should never, ever, 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 ever ignore or disregard a hot moment comment like the ones that were made about the Asian community, about um, racism not being that bad, about racial profiling, et cetera, et cetera. And you shouldn't because you can make the, the person who's making the comment feel as though their comment is valid or justified. And then um, you also can and will, I promise you, lose trust from the students who may have been um, offended. And so as I mentioned earlier, um, trust in the classroom and in the advisement experiences is paramount. And you want to be able to um, support and continue to perpetuate trust in the classroom. So I'm going to run us through how we could address this specific comment, right? So we're going to use the framework in which um, was a part of the required readings in um, students making inappropriate remarks. And this is based on um, Aubert um, that did a lot of work around um, the open the front door to communication technique or framework. And so we want to clarify what we heard. So student did I want to make sure that I heard you correctly. Did you say, did you make this disparaging comment about the Asian community, about COVID-19 and um, hate crimes that are associated with it? So if the student disagrees um, with you and they try to backtrack or cover their tracks, then you can say, I'm glad um, that I was able to clarify what it was that you were trying to say, because these comments can be um, um, perceived to be racist. And as we already agreed in our classroom, because we made community um, guidelines that um, we're trying to perpetuate or create the environment that is inclusive to all students, and that comment would not be, right? But if um, the student doesn't do that, and they double down on their comment, then what you want to say or paraphrase is how to um, get an understanding of the intent behind the comment that was made. So can you help me understand what you meant by that, right? Um, I want to explore the impact that your comment has on your colleagues, not just in this classroom, but all across campus, and how it runs counter to Wofford's values, right, and to the values that you yourself have committed to um, perpetuating as well in the classroom. And when I hear you make this comment, the possible impact that it might have um, is that Asian students or students that have experienced racial profiling and, and being stopped by police or, or other reasons um, can perpetuate negative experiences. And again, that's not what we're here um, um, to do. And we agreed that we wouldn't do those things. And so also providing facts about um, the rate in which certain folks um, have contracted and died from COVID might be important to counter whatever misinformation that that student has, facts about um, racial profiling, facts about um, racism as it operates not just interpersonally or individually, but systemically and institutionally is going to be important. In order to do those things, I recognize that folks have to have some sort of understanding about that. And so that's why these talks and the resources that we provided through the anti-racism guide is so important 
to help folks be able to um, have those discussions and be able to, to counter those comments. And so I know we're at time, but I'm gonna try to fit in a few um, questions here. And I want to thank Dr. Buffet for co-moderating with me and I wanna thank the panelists for, for their insights as well. And so um, let's see, first, question here. The first question that I am going to ask, how do we, and I'm going to direct this towards Dr. Topaz. You talked a little bit about ungrading. Or, or not grading. Can you talk more about that and how it operates to um, create an anti-racist practice in a classroom or in advising experience? Sure, I guess it, it's a great question and I guess it starts from me having sort of a learner-centered approach to my teaching. Um, students who come into my classroom are all coming from different places, they all have different goals, they all have different challenges, this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I've experimented with the grading system I use for something like 20, 20 I don't know, five years or something, 22 years. Um, and I've never come across one that in the end I was really convinced was equitable. Um, and so then I, I heard about this ungrading movement and I started reading and it just made sense to me. I mean, it basically says, look, if you don't believe grades are a real thing and if you don't believe they're fair, how about you just stop doing them? Um, and so that's, that's the basic idea is just that it's just removing a hierarchy. I think that's the most simple way I can put it. Thank you. And can I to interject, Dean? Um, I just want to add something really quickly sure. to Dr. Lope, um, Dr. Topaz. Dr. Topaz. Um, how would you put those ungrading mechanisms into like grades? You know, you have to submit grades at the end of the semester. Right. You so just give them a grade at the end, or how? You no. Yeah. Great question. So what I'm going to do is every single week, at the end of every week in my course students are gonna fill out a self-evaluation and it's always the same self-evaluation every week. And the idea is that they'll carry over their answers from the previous week, but maybe update them. And they have to answer five questions. And the questions are, why are you taking this course and what are your goals for yourself? The second question is, articulate a plan for how you're going to do this course. Like how much time are you going to spend? How are you going to allocate it? What are you gonna do when you encounter challenges? Who are you gonna collaborate with? Whatever, like, have a plan. Um, the third question is keeping in mind your goals, what sort of criteria or metrics or experiences or reflections will you use to evaluate your own progress towards those goals? Um, the fourth thing is now using those criteria that you just articulated, evaluate your progress. How do you think you're doing according to everything you've said? And then the last thing is that I say you're gonna be revising your answers to this a week from now. And so in light of your own evaluation of yourself, like, is there anything that you plan to change over the next week? Okay, and then in terms of the, and I'm gonna put a lot of time into um, responding to those and just helping students develop specific plans. But literally what the ungrading is, is at the end of the course, I will say to students, based on your self-evaluations, what grade do you want me to assign you? They'll tell me, and that is the grade I am gonna tell the registrar. And then a question, um, and maybe we could get each panelist to give us 30 seconds on this one. Um, how do you go about finding um, different scholars who are not cisgender white men um, to diversify your syllabus and your curriculum? I'm sorry, Tefa, can you rephrase the question? Sure. So um, as we talked about before, a lot of the academy is focused on, like you said, Dr. Hallaby, Shakespeare, old dead white men, right? Um, how do we diversify or how do we go about finding the scholars 
who aren't who are um, diverse and who have diverse perspectives and insert that work into the curriculum. So this question is specifically about finding those folks um, and finding those scholars that we can use to to diversify the curriculum. How do you do that if um, you have been taught Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet and all of these things, um, and now you're a professor yourself, um, and you know you don't want to teach. Macbeth and, and Romeo and Juliet and Twelfth Night, whatever it is anymore, right? I want to teach more um, and focus more on these diverse perspectives. How do I go about finding those scholars? Uh, you ask the students and they'll tell you what they're reading. They'll tell you what's you know, uh, hip. They'll tell you what they're interested in. And if they're interested in it, they'll be more likely to learn it and pay attention and be engaged. If we are giving them no options and we're teaching them what we think is good, we're outdated, right? We're, we're not relevant anymore. We ask them, what is it that you want me to, what, what do you want me to introduce into the classroom that you would be interested in and engaged in, right? And I mean, at the beginning, you want a syllabus, right? You want to tell them what you're going to be teaching. Right, but I mean, it doesn't have to be 100% either way, right? If there is a something that you need to to teach because of I don't know some law or something, then you do that. But you can also ask them what it is that they want to learn, and I am very sure that they'll be more engaged, more willing to learn, and they'll gain more and take more out of that classroom than if you just made the curriculum yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Goodson, 30 seconds response. Um, I'm a scientist, so we, we do scientific principles um, in class. Um, but environmental science involves science, natural sciences, which are, you know, scientific laws. You, you can't get around that. And then, you know, the social part of it. And so in the social part of it is where I implement um some of the things that are going on in the world so i'm not necessarily looking at old textbooks i'm looking at what's on the news i'm looking at what's going on in our communities and i implement that into the classroom thank you dr topaz yep very quick answer the history of math is a history of people of color and women largely all being excluded um and the way I get around that is, believe it or not, uh, I'll mention my one resource that I love, Twitter. Twitter is a horrible place, but it's also an amazing place because I have found there the community both of non-white male heterosexual cisgender scholars who work at math and or the community of people who are plugged into the history. And I frequently will go to Twitter and ask a question about you know, um, looking for sources from diverse scholars on a particular topic, and I very quickly get great suggestions from smart people. Thank you so much. Um, we have a member of our anti-racism action team, Professor Scott Felder, who is also weighing in on this question and um, advises folks to look into peers at historically black colleges and universities and professional groups comprised of people of color. Um, you also might be interested in um, seeking out some colleagues from um, Hispanic serving institutions as well and scholars there. Um, um, I would like to weigh in really quickly and also um, point out that, man, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> if I remember, I will broadcast it to the to the breakout groups. Um, but there there are ways in which um, folks I remember because it's about Twitter. Um, hashtag Black in the Ivory is a great um, resource as well. If you want to go on Twitter and check that out, there are a lot of Black scholars there um, talking about their experience in academia and the struggles that they go through and trying to um, publish works and, and things along those lines. So those that's a good resource as well. So we are pastime um but i did want to thank our um panelists for for their insight today i also want to take the time to recognize dr ann katia through her partnership in this portion of the series um, because it was a collaborative effort with this group um, the anti-racism action team and the cil i also want to 
um, acknowledge Dr. Trina Janet Jones for her support in making these sessions a reality. And last but certainly not least, I want to uplift um, my friends and colleagues, the organizers of these anti-racism sessions, Dr. Jim Neighbors, Dr. Rita and Liebert, Dr. Camille Bethay, Dr. Kim Rostan, Dr. Kimberly Hall, Dr. Tasha Smith Tyus, Professor Jessica Scott Felder, Mr. James Stutes, Ms. Tiara Woney, and our lovely hostess with the mostest, um, Nadia Glover. As colleagues, we have um, realized our commitment to host these sessions throughout the summer and thank you all for your support and participation in this work. This fall, we will be focusing our efforts in supporting departments and divisions that are interested in um, consulting on how to incorporate anti-racist pedagogy and inclusive practices into programs, curriculum, syllabus, but also holding those um, departments accountable for the work that they committed themselves to in the beginning of the summer in their um, um, statements in solidarity with Black lives. So if anyone's interested in seeking assistance in how to do that, please reach out to any one of us on the team and we'll assist you from there. In the meantime, we've updated the Anti-Racism Action Guide with a list of resources that may be helpful to you in developing your anti-racist skills, and we'll provide those resources via email at a later date. So this concludes the Q&A portion of the program. For those of you who indicated you wanted to engage in the optional breakout discussions, our host is going to begin that process now. Again, in the breakout rooms, you'll have up to 19 minutes to debrief and discuss the session. After your discussion, the anti-racism organizer assigned to your room will dismiss you from the session and you don't have to return.